Hey guys, David Vos here. Oh boy, it snowed. It's still snowing. And it's going to be cold. I don't remember which day it is coming up. A couple days it's going to be like below zero, like five degrees below zero or something. It's just really neat. We're sitting here by the fire and the dogs are laying by the fire and just sitting there looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. Well, I'm going to share something with you today. We got to go into a certain part of the story to kind of really get and understand why it is that we are where we're at. Why Christianity is not understanding. Because it's hard to know whether it's just human ignorance People forgetting? Is it bad people creeping in? Greed? Can you imagine in the days of the apostles, they said that the apostasy is already set in. It's already happening, the apostles said. They said that. They said the apostasy has already dug deep into the Church and when, what we can say by the words of the apostles and themselves and them warning the Antichrist cometh even now, right? This is the last hour. Last hour of what? Before the great new age comes and the Antichrist reigns and comes up out of the bottomless pit. They were living before 70 in the last hour of that old age. The age of the law. Jesus conquered the law. He freed us. And now it's just a spiritual battle because we're already free, but they are trying to deceive us with the mind now and not so much with the sword, although they you can use the sword as well. But it's primarily a higher classroom now. We're learning things. This is a, yeah, it's all being orchestrated. There's a classroom going on. <clears throat> Our father's in charge. He's not going to let anything happen that he doesn't want to happen. But when you go on an Easter egg hunt, um, you're searching for some things. And it's going to take time to find the egg. But the fact that you're already looking for the Easter egg means that, number one, you're playing a game. Somebody's going to win the game. They get a prize. And if you're looking for eggs, somebody's already placed them manually somewhere and hid them. And what is hidden is meant to be revealed. So Jesus came not to just get a sword and whop off the evil dictator's head and free us. If he had done that, we'd have all went back into apostasy within... A very short time as we did either way we would have because the 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 evil dictator was only ruling over us because we were ignorant because we were children there's parables that talk about how it was the Lord himself that appointed them over us but they fell this is why we're not supposed to appoint newly appointed men because their pride they're newly appointed they don't have wisdom yet they haven't been tried and uh, they're not, as the Apostle Paul says, men that are irreprehensible and not newly converted, lest they sin the, lest they fall in their pride in the sin that Satan fell with, the sin of Satan or being lifted up and exalted before you have maturity and you end up because the lower ego see is just a babe and it, 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 it isn't ready for that power it gets angry and jealous and that was the lower ego Yahweh the newly converted man the devil so Jesus came at the appointed time in other words, mankind had 
reached the point when the sun was about to rise. That happens every year. Well, when you're talking about summer, there's a certain spring equinox. We know exactly when it's going to happen. It's cyclical. These are things that the great, you know, ones have known and mankind has got history going back for millions of years. And I don't suppose in the millions of billions of trillions of years of the history of the universe, somebody just smacked their head and said, I could have had a V8. Like we should have been doing this all along, like billions of trillions of infinite, infinite, like Infinity, this is almost too hard to even comprehend. Because if the past was infinite, then how'd we ever get to the future? We'd just still be going on and 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 on in the past. See, so that can't be true. The past cannot be infinite. What? You're saying we had a beginning? We're not immortal? No, what I'm saying is if we had a past, we couldn't be immortal. Just like if we have a future, we can't be immortal. Because all that is immortal is the now. You see, and so everything that we think of in this universe, when we think in terms of the past or the, or the future, or good and evil, or left and right, or, you know, the knowledge of good and evil is the material world, that, where there is time and space. And at the founding of this world, Right? There was Twa and Boa. There was the empty and the void. And then there was the separation between light and day and land and air and all these separations. Well, the separation is consciousness. is the lower consciousness. And it's not conscious of everything all at once. But now you've got variables. Duality. <clears throat> so we're in the material world. And I want to tell you a little secret that you may not be able to find anywhere. Because this is something that none of these schools or mystery schools, or religions, or wise men have ever known. Mankind has been pursuing it. Jesus told them, but they didn't understand his parable, and they went away very sorrowful. The apostles were inspired to say the truth, but I don't know that they fully understood it. No man probably can, but I will tell you anyway. When we talk about these things, when we talk about heaven and our divine father and our divine mother, we're not talking about anything that is in this conscious world where we see things in terms of duality and the past and the future. So our divine heavenly father didn't exist in the past and our divine mother didn't exist in the past or in the future. And we'll never achieve this place that's in Genesis chapter 1, which is the um, blueprint, which is the the creation itself, the reality, paradise, but it's an ever progressive state that we're pursuing. It is the ultimate, which is what? At the other end of infinity in the future. But that doesn't exist because it exists, but not in the sense of time, but in the sense of your mind. Time and space is just a concept. So it does exist as a concept. And what is a concept? Your imaging or your thoughts. So you change your thoughts and you change and then bam, now we see something different. It's different than what was, so therefore we'll call that what has become. And what has become is the future. But you were there all along before you understood it. And when you conceived it and brought it forth in birth and when it was first brought into the world and adorned with this little swaddling band and you nourished it and guided it because you understood that you are the thinker. The child comes from you. Nowhere else. That's the mystery. Where did you think people came from? Some bearded man in the sky? What is he doing up there floating around in yonder heaven? That's the prototype that's the divine comedy. We're always going to live in duality. The duality is going to change. So the highs are going to get higher and the lows are going to get higher. The lows don't get worse. You know, we don't 
the pain, the amount of pain and suffering that we have in this world, you'll notice that it's balanced with pleasures and joys. And we wouldn't want it any other way. Now, there are people that get into such terrible situations, but a lot of it's in our head because the worst thing that ever happened to you, you could die. And you really don't die, do you? So there's a lot of fear involved, but that's all it is because the minute you stop being afraid and you realize that you're making this whole thing, that the, the infinite past where we came from is where we're going, but we just got to think it. So the story of these divine beings in this paradise where no one died is the goal. But you see our Heavenly Father, where we're trying to get to, you know, I'm going unto my Father. You cannot come right now. We're trying to get there. <clears throat> and our New Testament gives us axioms. This is a mathematical consideration here. We're, we're not going to leave this up to some kind of guessing work, you know, or feelings. But what we're doing, like Pythagoras, who understood geometry, the great sacred geometry of architecture, we're architecting the universe, right? Arc and tectos, which is, you know, the word that Jesus' father was, the carpenter, that's architect, right? So it's a little bit like the Masonic words. They had different words in different languages that express these individuals that were not chemists, but alchemists. Today we get chemistry. It's all material. They don't, they've devoided it from the spiritual. They don't understand chemistry. It's all chemistry. Why are we trying to decide the differences between weights and measures and, and, and metals and minerals and charts and all of these? There's nothing. What are we going to learn how to make more material things and weapons and wars? You know, you could, you don't need to do that. We could break it down but we're wasting our time looking at illusions and shadows. Let's get into the light. We already know this stuff, but you want to break it down so that your conscious mind can understand it. And what you're doing is you're, you're putting your spiritual mind on pilot. And your, your being, your consciousness is all wrapped up in the material and, your, and it's fear because what happens when the material dies in this duality? So, the progression is toward the light. But guess what? Our Father, our divine family, Elohim, the blueprint for the family, the macrocosm, which is something we can't conceive, the macro. It's infinite. We can't conceive it. The only way is to understand it in the micro, in the moment, because it's all there in the moment. Exactly. And everything else in the macro is nothing but the moment. But it's just you as you understand it. So the Bible tells us that our Heavenly Father dwells in unapproachable light. It's unapproachable. That's why Moses was told by El Elyon, you cannot see my face, my forward, the future, and yet live. Not in this world. He says, well, I'll show you my backside. What's the backside? Well, we study that all the time. That's a microscope. And we're looking and studying and trying to see down deep inside of things and analyze and catalog and understand. But what we're doing is getting involved in confusion. We've separated ourselves from the light. We're going backwards. We need to go forward. So when Jesus came, I said all that, probably as somewhat of a divergence, but where we were talking before I left off and went into that tantrum was that Jesus came in the past, the first time, and he's going to come again. And the two comings is simply when we first conceive of the truth, when we're capable of grasping the truth, even barely, with parables, and therefore start molding our psyche around these truths, start awakening to this light. Because when the light 
begins to shine at dawn, not many people jump right up immediately. Most of us yawn and stretch, got to get our coffee, sit for a few minutes and watch the sun come up over the horizon. At the beginning, when it first reaches the horizon, it's still kind of weird, fantastic colors. Well, there's a scientific reason for that, of course, because the sun is at an angle to which, just like the sunsets, there's orange and yellows and purples and pinks. So the, the whole world in the morning is, is like a, a fairy tale because it's got these beautiful colors. Same with the evenings. I love the colors. Yellows and oranges and pinks. And it, even the trees can take on the, the colors <clears throat> around you. And you're still kind of going over your dreams. You, you, you don't remember where you were. You weren't here in this world. You weren't even conscious of this world. You were doing something in your mind. What were you do? Were you just a, a computer that's plugged into the wall and somebody's um, got you into some program that's defragging everything that, you know, what is it? Are we just some computer? No, we're, we're the divine being. We're always being. But there's time when we are consciously doing things and then there's a time when we rest. And we just, we want to forget about it because you see the thing, but this is, you can't ever be divorced from life. You don't have to be afraid. It's kind of like saying, I like to run and play, but I can only run and play for a little while and then I get tired. Well, why? Because you see, it has nothing to do with the muscles. The muscles at, are at our beck and call. If we wanted to, we could be awake. We would have energy. Energy is just mind. We could have that energy and never get tired if we wanted to. But that's the reason why sometimes we get tired because what that means is that we have a change of mind. We want to do something else. We get bored with something. So we rest from that. We go do something else. Now, Let's say that you want to build a house. There's a time when you build the house. You're out there physically building it. But before you build a house, you got to plan it. You got to sit and think about what you want to do. Everything in life is that way. You got to ponder it, imagine it, build it, and then rest in it and live in it. So the world is, is, is natural. But Jesus did wake up one day and say, you know, I should have been down there on earth. Dying for the world, right? Telling them the good news. Why did I wait for thousands of years if, if creation, and you know, the, even if we just go by the 6,000 years in, in the Bible that people think is there? What, why did Jesus wait so long before he came to the earth and told us about his father? Because you see, Eve was initiated into the knowledge of good and evil. We have to die in order that we might live. And there's cycles. And so the sun rises on the horizon. Then, it, of course, it sets on the other side and goes down. There's rest and there's work. There's darkness and there's light. So at the appointed time, the light comes up over the horizon. Jesus comes up and now the, for the first hour, there's 12 hours in a day, so the first house, 2,000 years, mankind is still getting our coffee. And we're sitting here debating. Mom and dad are sitting in the kitchen debating about what we're going to do. Counting the money to see what we can buy. Figuring out from the map where the town is that we're going to go to so we can get the stuff we need. and Or, or you know, we're going to go out in the backyard and build a house or what, or whatever we're going to do. But we've got a plan. So when Jesus came, he had to come initially as the first morning light, the dawn. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars And now, listen carefully to the song. Oh, say does that star-spangled 
banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now, what is a star-spangled banner? It's as the stars in the sky go by and they tell a story and it says our flag was still there. Our banner is yet waving in the sky and floating by. The stars are are showing forth the word of the Lord. And we see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming. When was the twilight's last gleaming? Well, the twilight is when the sun goes down. What so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Now, <laughs> the twilight means there's no sun. It's going down. And what do we see when the sun goes down? The broad stripes. The broad stripes, what could that be in the sky? We know what the gleaming stars are, but what are the bright stripes? Well, that's the bright rays of the sun. But you don't see the bright waves or stri- I mean uh, stripes of the sun or the rays in the daytime. You only see in the morning, just at that moment when the sun comes over the horizon, you see these rays going out in all directions, the broad stripes. And the twilight last gleaming, that's when you see that. So our flag represents the moment when the darkness was leaving the earth and the bright light of the sun begins to shine and gleam. The twilight is gone. The star-spangled banner. And a banner is something that you put up like a big sign and it reads something like, let's go saints, You're right? But the banner reads the astrological story, the story of Jesus Christ, And we were in Christ from the founding of the world. So it's a story about you, the fool in the deck of card, who's going through all of these houses. But when we reach the twilight's last gleaming, we see the broad stripes. And they're healing us. And the dawn's early light. Well, there's more here. We got a perilous fight. When is the fight over? And the bright stars gleaming. And what is that? A perilous fight. We got to get and plant that flag at the top of the hill. The top of the hill is victory and that's the day. And the day starts with the dawn's early light. But you see, Jesus came and that was the dawn's early light. And it might sound like the song is saying that we're still in that early light. And we are. But we're about to get a brighter view. Okay? The fight is already done. We've got the flag. We've planted it. And the way to plant this flag is we've got to overcome. We've got to be overcomers. So Jesus came and told us about the Father. Right? But then he said, now I want you to have faith and I want you to go out there and conquer. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Now go and do it. And I'm going to give you all a bunch of talents and you use them. And we're going to have a judgment when I come back. When I come back, I want to see who of you has progressed and has won the race and is appreciative of this beautiful world that I've, you know, you've been wise stewards because we're all going to move forward. But those who are the faithful and wise servants that that gave the food at the proper time to his domestics and fed the hungry and clothed the sick. They were the ones that had the love. Those are the ones that are going to reign in my kingdom when I return because I am the light and nothing reigns in the light but love. You better get with the program. So now 2,000 years later, Jesus is about to return. And this time, 
Every eye will see him. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bend. Now I guarantee that that's about to happen. Because the word, it's going to happen suddenly though. Because he says he comes as a thief, as a thief of the night, and many will be thrown into the outer darkness. Some will not have lamp oil, and the, and they won't be able to go in unto him when he arrives. Well, that doesn't mean they, they don't get eternal life. It just means they don't get to go in with the Christ into the inner chamber where mommy goes in with daddy and this beautiful thing takes place. Right? And we conceive a new kingdom. The children will all return. Because that's why mommy and daddy went in there. Because it's a beautiful, it's already been planned. We got ceremonies to explain this. Now, today we got children that are being born and they're being thrown out in the streets. They don't, what are we teaching them? How to have a job or a career? Nonsense. But we don't teach them how to love one another. We don't teach women how to be a woman. We don't know what a woman is. We don't teach men how to be men. We don't know what a man is. Men don't know that their job is to subject themselves to that woman and become a good listener, to fall in love, to cooperate. We've got a job to do together and we don't understand how to do it. Jealousy could come along anger, misconception, if we don't have teachers, by example. So, there were certain virgins, like we said the other day, the Mormons, when you get to be 18, you go on a mission. You come back and then they give you a big job. See, they're still doing this thing. The only problem is, is that they've turned this beautiful plan of our Heavenly Father and these great mysteries that we're supposed to prepare us for the true world, the true government of love, which is the mommy and the daddy and the heirs, which is us, and the eating and the drinking and the dining and the the joy and the singing and the inspiration and the love and all of these things that we're supposed to have. But nobody knows how to love. We're hating one another. It's like, Instead of somebody like mom and dad with love being in the family teaching the daughters the trade of being a woman. Now, you're a woman. This is what you are. You're a beautiful, amazing part of this universe. You you are so needed. And if you don't know how to do your job, you can fall into some kind of confusion and you're family will fall apart. If mommy don't know what she's doing, the children will, will grow up without knowing anything. And if daddy is not in harmony with mother and he's not, if he's proud and boastful and doesn't, you know, like he's so ignorant, he doesn't know. He knows that his body wants, me want woman. But he doesn't, he doesn't understand the woman, how he should be he doesn't know how to please a woman. He doesn't know how to love a woman. He doesn't know how to treat a woman. That's the most important job of society. As we said, the Vestal Virgin is the woman of the hearth. The hearth is the altar. It's worship. What is worship? We Today we think worship is some stupid religion, some cult. Some beliefs. We don't have beliefs. We have a world that was destined. Frogs live in swamps. And wolves live in the woods. The rabbits live down little holes and prairies and eat flowers. These are just realities. And the rabbit's not going to be happy if he doesn't have flowers. Women won't be happy without a family and a, and a husband and their children and their gardens and their life and their progressions and their learnings and all the love and the and the perfumes and the and the and the, and the pleasures that, that come with life but you can't have any of those good things you're going to build a house right well you, you don't need a house 
Go fast and pray, boy. You don't need a house. Yeah, we do. We got to have an architect. We've got to build it. We got to decide what kind of a house. Why? Because we want to be happy. We're planning our futures. So we're not left into this world without knowing what to do. It was all written down. The, the priesthood guided the children. It was all about, you know, today Mormons say, oh, it's about the family. Family time, family hour, and right, this is family day, and all of this, it's all about the family, the family unit. And you hear that from presidents in past, you know, they, oh, I believe the, the, the family is important, and, and we've got to strengthen the family. And then what, a couple years later, they started talking about transgenders and gays and because they were trying to destroy the family. Who were they? Somebody that was completely ignorant about what the truth is and why we're supposed to have families, and why, why there is a divine being and a purpose to this world because it's all been, the greedy people burned all the books they don't know what it's about anymore. I guarantee you the reason we don't know anything about these Vestal Virgins is because if we did know about them, we'd know that there was a divine priesthood that was in every world, in every country, in every culture. And it was to prepare people of every nation how to live and be happy. We're supposed to be happy, but we're not happy anymore. Because we tell a little boy, well, you know, he's 13. Now, he's bad. He's a bad boy because he has he thinks about little girls. And instead of being told what that urge is and, and how it's going to be used to have a family and, and how to not, you know, scare the girl off, but how to love her so that she'll want him, how to take care of the family, because he's going to love his children. He's going to have to know what his duties are. The woman's going to have to know what her duties are. They're going to have to be taught from the divine family and what they do as an example, what our heavenly father and what our divine mother does. If we're going to learn the example of how to be from Yahweh, the lower ego, you know, he's in his wrath, he throws tantrums and he wants to kill everybody. And Moses is like, please don't kill everybody in your wrath. What about the reputation that you're going to give to the rest of the world? And they're going to think you're evil. You let them all out of Egypt just to let them out in the desert and die? That ain't going to look too good on you. So he convinced Yahweh to repent. Our Heavenly Father doesn't repent. He doesn't need to repent. Because his goal is to love us. He's awake. He has purpose. And so Jesus came to tell us the truth. But what happened was he also told us that as soon as he left the world and put the teachings in the church, we were going to have to be faithful and not to appoint newly converted men to this post and to make sure that the ones who lead us are irreprehensible. Husbands of one wife. And men who have the demonstrable power of the Holy Spirit, which is the wisdom of the mind. The Holy Spirit is, the, is Sophia, it's wisdom. So when you get the Holy Spirit, what does it mean? You, you, you stop being a ignorant fool and thinking that somehow or other laws and Anger and hate and war is going to help. But you become enlightened. You receive the holy mind and you understand grace and love. And there's degrees to that. You can first know about it technically. Jesus, yeah, I'm going to my father. I'll tell you about that. But if you want to know and go to the father yourself, you got to have faith. If you want to be healed, you must have faith. Jesus, heal me. Can you? Jesus, if I can... Do you have enough faith? Do you believe I can? I can do anything. You can do anything with faith. But we had to grow. But first we have to be given the lesson, read the book, and at the end of the class, we'll be graded on what we read. Jesus is coming back, friends. Very soon, every eye will see. Everyone, even if you don't see it now, 
If you don't see it now because you're not faithfully searching, you'll be brought to your knees in another way. But you will eventually see. Every eye will. But let us be wise stewards. Let us not lose our reward. So, I'm going to read you something here in Wikipedia. It's called Theotokos. You've never heard of that, have you? Mother of Deity redirects here. Theotokos. It's the title of Mary, Mother of Jesus. It was used especially in the Eastern Christianity. The usual Latin translations are Dia Gentrix or Dia Para or Parent of Deity. Familiar English translations are Mother of God or Deity Bearer, but these both have different literal equivalents in Greek. The title has been in use since the 3rd century. Well, of course, it's much older than that, but we're just talking about what they think Christianity is. You know, they, they're not going to trace it back to the pagan priestesses because they don't even know all the stuff that we've been explaining here. But anyway, this goes back, this title, to the 3rd century in the Syriac tradition. It was Romanized Yaldath Alaiha Yoldath Alaho in the liturgy of Mary and Ade and the literature of St. James, 4th century. The Council of Ephesus in AD 431 decreed that Mary is the Theotokos because her son Jesus is both deity and man, one divine person from two natures, divine and human, intimately and hostile potestically united. The title of Mother of Deity or Mother of Incarnate Deity abbreviated is the most often abbreviated of the first and last letter of each word in Greek is most often used in English largely due to the lack of satisfactory equivalent of the Greek tokos for the same reason the title is often left untranslated as Theotokos in orthodox liturgical usages of other languages. The Theotokos is also used as the term for an Eastern icon or type of icon or of the mother with child, typically called Madonna in Western tradition. As in the Theotokos of Vladimir, both for the original 12th century icon and for icons that are copies or imitate his composition. And down here it says the status of Mary as Theotokos was a topic of theological dispute in the 4th and the 5th centuries and was the subject of the decree of the Council of Ephesus in 431. To the effect that in opposition to those who denied Mary the title Theotokos, the one who gives birth to deity, but called her Christotokos, the one who gives birth to Christ. Mary is Theotokos because her son Jesus is one person who is both deity and man, divine and human. This decree created the Nestorian Schism. Now, what is the Nestorian Schism? Well, I'll click on that here in a second, but Cyril of Alexandria wrote, I am amazed that there are some who are entirely in doubt as to whether the Holy Virgin should be called Theotokos or not. For if our Lord Jesus Christ is deity, how is the Holy Virgin who gave birth to him not Theotokos? But the argument of Nestorius was that the divine and the human natures of Christ were distinct. And while Mary is evidently the Christotokos, the bearer of Christ, it could be misleading to describe her as the bearer of deity. At issue is the interpretation of the incarnation and the nature of the hypostatic union of Christ's human and divine natures between Christ's conception and birth. Now friends, the reason I'm telling you this is because this is the apostasy. 
I am describing to you what they came together in these creeds and the Nicenian and the Athanasian creeds and all these different, these big wars and the fight. You know, we, we, we hear about Constantine. Constantine was from Constantinople, from the Byzantinian, the Eastern Empire. They were the Goths that were coming down and they took over Rome. And they brought with them some different teachings. They didn't believe in the woman. They got really mad. See, all the people from Alexandria and the people from Rome believed in the virgin and all the virgins and the virgin mother and Theos and all the deities. It was this other group that did not like this. Now, this is important to understand what the apostasy is. We're apostates, and it's only getting worse. Now, yes, the church did affirm, before it got too bad and all the fighting was going on, they affirmed that Mary was the mother of deity. But these other Goths didn't lose the battle. They kept fighting, and they brought on Protestantism and finally Job's Witnesses who canvassed the world with the idea that we've got to go back to Yahweh and keep his laws. The Whites said, I don't think that Ellen White was a bad person. I think she was a genius. I think she was brilliant. I think that they didn't want her to be willy-nilly telling people truths. And so they, I believe her husband was one of these elite individuals that was on the bad side and they wanted to use her wisdom. I mean, they, they made these religions, but it was all a concerted effort. Even Herbert Armstrong didn't know he's being used. Same, he starts over there in Pasadena, California at a college. That's exactly where Aleister Crowley had his temple. That's where Satanism started. That's where Hollywood started. This is Scientology. Everybody started there. Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses started over in Brooklyn, but they're the ones that brought all these Germans over there to Hollywood in Pasadena. And these were all a group of individual barbarians that created all these religions. But let me show you the um, Nestorian Schism. The Nestorian Schism, 431. Remember, they took over in 405. They, they put out the flame in 394 and got rid of the Vestal Virgins. The Nestorian Schism, just 25, 26 years later, was a split between the Christian churches of Sassanid Persia which affiliated with Nestorius and those that later became the Catholic and Orthodox churches. The schism rose out of the Christological dispute, notably involving Cyril, Patriarch of Alexandria, and Nestorius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. You see, Constantinople was up there where Constantine came. Now, take a look at this. The First Council of Ephesus in 431 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451 condemned Nestorius and his doctrine. See, they were, the good people in the church were still saying, nope, 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 we're not doing this. Now look at this. This is the history of the early church. The term was certainly in use by the 4th century. Athanasius of Alexandria in 330, Gregory the Theologian in 370, John Chrysostom in 400, and Augustine all used Theotokos, who were all they. They were the early church. Origen is often cited as the earliest author to use Theotokos for Mary. The oldest preserved extant hymn dedicated to the Virgin Mary has been continually prayed and sung for at least 16 centuries in the original Koine Greek vocative as Theotoki. The oldest record of this hymn is a papyrus found in Egypt. In Egypt! mostly dated to after 450, but according to the suggestion by de Villiers, possibly older, dating to the 3rd or the mid-3rd century. The 3rd Euconymical Council 
The use of Theotokos was formally affirmed at the third eucanimical council held at Ephesus in 431. They proclaimed that Mary truly became the mother of deity by the human conception of the son of deity in her womb. The competing view advocated by Patriarch Nestorius of Constantinople. So he was the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now this is going to show you where, this is where the apostasy, it's not, I'm not saying this is where it began. It began because the Goths came down and, and, and been warring with Rome for hundreds of years. They were trying to take over. This has been a dispute since Cain and Abel were there leaving the garden. But what I'm saying is, is that this is all leading up, this dispute is leading up to this. The devil is behind the scenes trying to get us to deny our mother and the family, the family unit, and to go back and to worship the, the lower ego, which is this male energy, which is blind, doesn't know, and is in confusion or schizophrenic and doesn't know the female energy. So, Nestorius' opponent, led by Cyril of Alexandria. Now, see, the people down in Alexandria, that's where the, the Temple of Jerusalem was, in Heliopolis, and it was all the library was taken from there to Alexandria. Now, we're going to talk about the library and the word canon here in just a minute. And we're going to see that we're, we're, we're told these words, but we're not putting them together. We don't see that the whole dispute is that early Christians had a canon, in other words, law, what they believed, canon law, and it meant their books that they accepted. The books that we have now is a rejection of that Alexandria, the Egyptian Coptic and the Nagamedi Library and the Gnostics, and it's a an acceptance of the Arian view that took over and the Nestorian view and the Patriarch of Constantinople, which is Constantine, who took over the church. Look, uh, the opponents of Nestorius, the Patriarch at Constantinople, was led by Cyril of Alexandria, viewed this as dividing Jesus into two distinct persons. The human, who was son of Mary, and the divine, who was not. To them, this was unacceptable, since by destroying the perfect union of the divine and the human natures in Christ, it sabotaged the fullness of the incarnation and, by extension, the salvation of humanity. The council accepted Cyril's reasoning, affirmed the title Theotokos for Mary, and anamethatized Nestorius' view as heresy. Now, the reason why this is so important the Nestorian church, known as the Church of the East, that's the Constantine and, and the Byzantine and the Eastern Empire, which is now converted to the Gothic beliefs. The, Christianity could be any religion in the world. It was the mysteries. But there were those in the mystery schools that had lost the teachings of the woman. And those were those who were going to the lower ego, and taking the books literally and not understanding the grace or the esoteric. And they became materialists. And today we call them rationalists. And this is where we get Marxism and Nietzsche and all these other people, and Freud and Darwin. So the Church of the East rejected the decision of the Council of Ephesus and its confirmation at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. This was... The apostasy that had already happened, 405, they destroyed Rome. But now they're trying to destroy the spirit and take away the truth and take away our mother from our minds, not just put out the flame and, 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 and end the Vestal Virgins and all the priesthood. Somehow they've convinced us that Christianity was something like Judaism and now it's pagan. But what is actually true is we're looking at the early church that was the virgin birth, the paganism. It was later on the apostasy was going back to Judaism, as Paul said, would happen. Now, they rejected these councils. 
This was the church of the Sassanian Empire during the late 5th and the early 6th centuries. The schism ended in 544 when the patriarch Abba I ratified the decision of Chalcedon. After this, there was no longer technically any Nestorian church. Church following the doctrine of Nestorianism, although legends persisted that still further to the east, such a church was still in existence. Associated with, in particular, with the figure of Prester John. Now, <clears throat> Prester John was revered amongst those who followed John the Baptist. Well, they didn't accept Christ. There were some of them that never did accept Christ. And they revered John more than Jesus. This was more or less the apostasy. So, <clears throat> we've got the Lutheran tradition. And we've got, clear down to John Paul. And we're still fighting about this. But what people don't know is going on here is the church apostatized by going back to Judaism. Now, this is critical here. The Euconymical Patriarch of Constantinople. The Euconymical Patriarch is the Archbishop of Constantinople, Istanbul. The New Rome and Primus Inter Paris or the first among equals. Among the heads of the several autocephalous churches, which compose the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Euconymical Patriarch is regarded as the representative and the spiritual leader of the Eastern Orthodox Christian worldwide. The term Euconymical in the title is a historical reference to the Ecumene, a Greek designation for the civilized world, the Roman Empire, and it stems from Canon 28 of the Council of Chalcedon. The Euconomical Patriarchate of Constantinople is one of the most enduring institutions in the world, has had a prominent part in world history. The Euconomical Patriarchs in ancient times helped in the spread of Christianity. No, they helped in the destruction of Christianity and the spread of false, wicked apostasy. And the resolution of various doctrinal disputes in the Middle Ages, they played a major role in the affairs of the Orthodox Church as well as the politics of the Orthodox world and in the spreading Christianity among the Slavs. Currently, in addition, this is why up in Russia and the Slav, up in that area, there's a lot of this Eastern Orthodox beliefs. Patriarchs are involved in the economism and interfaith and dialogue and blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> the early history of this is that, that Constantinople has had a continuous history since the founding of the city in 330 by Constantine the Great. After Constantine the Great had enlarged Byzantinium to make it into a second capital city in 330, it was thought appropriate that its bishop, once a suffragan on the Exarch of Thrace and Macedonia, the metropolitan of Heraclea, should be elevated to an archbishopric. For many decades, the heads of the Church of Rome opposed this ambition. This was too ambitious, right? The Bishop of Rome should not be the head of all the other bishops and have supremacy, and there shouldn't be the schism. They opposed it. Not because anyone thought of disputing their first place, but because they defended the Petrine principle by which all patriarchates were derived from St. Peter and were unwilling to violate the order of the hierarchy for political reasons. See, Constantinople split the church and violated the hierarchy of the Pope from Peter. Why? Because they wanted to take authority away from the bishops and give it to the Goths or the Antichrist, you might say. And this was basically going back to the male Judaism, the worship of Yahweh and the laws and the commandments and the canon. So we went to a different canon of law. We no longer looked at the canon of scripture called the Nag Hammadi Library or the Alexandrian Library and all the works of the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Sumerians and the ancient ones the ten tribes. But there was another library at Constantinople. They set it up there. They, they transferred it all there. But what they did was hid it. They buried it. 
They misinterpreted it. They mistranslated it. They infiltrated. It was a big scheme. The first council of Constantinople. This was the apostasy to get rid of the Divine Mother and the Vestal Virgins. That's why the Vestal Virgins were disbanded in 394 and the Holy Flame was put out in 395 and the Alexandria uh, uh, Alexandria Green Library was burned to the ground. See, what they did was they burned it so they could get rid of certain books. But many of the priests and the bishops preserved the writings and we found the Nagamati Library by Divine Providence in 1947. Or is it 1945? Five, I think. So, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 established Constantinople as a patriarchate with ecclesiastical jurisdiction over Asia Minor. In other words, power. The diocese of Assane and Pontus and Thrace, as well as over the barbaric territories, non-converted lands outside the divine area of the Western Patriarchate, the Old Rome, and the other three patriarchates Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem gave it appellation jurisdiction extraterritorially over canon law decisions by the other patriarchs and granted it honors equal to those belonging to the first Christian see, Rome, in terms of primacy. Rome retaining, however, its seniority. Leo I refused to accept this canon. They didn't want to accept the canon. What canon? That's what our Bible is, the canon. That's all we've got left, the 66 books. They rejected the the real church's canon, their law. And what is law? Law is the rule, the principles that came from the codified law or the written records by the priests, which is our Bibles. We no longer go by the canon of Jesus and his disciples, friends. The canon that was last seen with Valentinius, who was the bishop of Rome or almost became the Pope, but lost by about one or two votes. Now you know why he lost. You see, because the church that was, their priests were at Alexandria, Heliopolis. It was at Heliopolis, was moved to Alexandria, and then later to Rome. And that was the church up till 300 AD, it was still the church. Uh, Even even up till 394, when the Vestal Virgins were still in office. But the Goths were coming down. The Eastern Byzantine Empire became more powerful because first they defeated their armies. Then they went into the church and defeated and infiltrated the bishops, but with this other religion. And now they were all the same religion. It's just you got one side that is secretly trying to interpret all of the esoteric wisdom as though we do it literally that the physical and the material because it's out in front and it's got this power it should be allowed to use the power without the wisdom the mother there shouldn't we don't need a a, a wedding we got to keep people in deception in 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 bondage we've got to put them under law punish them so they went back this dualism they they became ignorant and they as jesus said they began to beat their fellow servants and they began to eat and drink with the drunkards and the gluttons so that's what happened in about 300 to 480 and it got worse until the six seven centuries and today the great apostasy is about to come to its climax and they're going to literally become anarchy in the streets So, Constantine was an infiltration. And when he got the bishops together to decide, what he did was he brought in a bunch of bishops from another another point of view. And over about 100 or 200 years, they outnumbered the good guys. And about that time, Alexander, and about that time, Valentinius was literally, at that point, I guess, one of the highest of, the, of those in office that were Gnostic and, and of the truth and understood the teachings of our mother. He was voted out. And here we are today. 
Well, I'm going to leave it there, guys. I hope you have a wonderful evening. We're going to get deeper into this tomorrow. And stay tuned because there's a lot of mind-blowing that's going to be coming.